Hi, everyone. We've got a lot to cover in chapter four, so I'm just going to jump right into it. We're talking about the English Empire, and the reason we're talking about that in U.S. history is because it had an impact on the formation of the United States. So in this chapter, you will learn to analyze the causes and the consequences of something called the Restoration. And if you don't know what that is, you're going to learn what that is, too. You'll be able to identify the Restoration colonies and their role in the expansionism of the British Empire. Also, you'll learn key figures and key players in British history who had a big impact on the formation of the United States. We are covering a period of time here from about 1660 to 1763, so just a little over 100 years. So usually in class, you'll hear me refer to Great Britain, sometimes England, and sometimes you'll hear it just anywhere referred to as one and the same. And technically, that's not exactly right. England would be part of Great Britain. So you see, Great Britain was created after the Union of England and Scotland in 1707. And anything then that was added to the British Empire became part of Great Britain. By the mid 1700s, Great Britain was a commercial and military powerhouse, which should come as no surprise. We already know that Great Britain had an awesome military because the English um, Navy defeated the Spanish Armada. So already strong. And if you can control um, trade, then you can make enough money to have an awesome military. So the two things go hand in hand. One of the other ways that Great Britain was making money at the time was through the British East India Company, which controlled trade and territory in India. So, you know, it's, it's going beyond England and Scotland. These people are, advent are adventuring out all across the world. Uh, British slave traders dominated the West African coast and the British West Indies that we now know as Barbados and Jamaica had lucrative sugar plantations. The American colony population also was on the rise at this time. In the early 1700s, there were about 250,000 British people in the colonies. By the mid 1700s, that number was bumped up to 1 million and included slaves. So just a little comparison to kind of give you an idea. I told you that in the early 1700s, the colony population was 250,000 people. So that was spread out over a whopping 430,000 square miles. Today, Little Rock's po uh, population is under 200,000, but those people are in a, a land area of 117 square miles. So you can see that uh, population crowding was not a problem in the early 1700s. Still though, these colonists wanted more and more territory, didn't they? So um, the ties between Great Britain and the colonies are strong at this point in the 1700s, the early to mid 1700s. I can't say that enough because at some point in my life and maybe in yours too, we kind of uh, condense everything. You know, when we talk about US history and we're like, oh, okay, the colonists wanted religious freedom. So they moved to the colonies so that they could get away from oppression. That's not true. Um, not 100% true. There might be a little truth to it, but really most of those people, most of the colonists came here for economic opportunity. These are people who, um, if they had no money back home, they felt like they had nothing to lose. They could get someone else to pay their fare to this new world and they could work off their fee, their passage across the ocean as an indentured servant and then they might have an opportunity to actually own land that they might not have ever had in England or an opportunity to trade or to make money or to learn a skill. The other people who came over also came for economic opportunity. They were people who already had money. So why would you do that? Why would you already have money and still want to go somewhere um, that you're basically pioneering? Well, a big part of it goes back to this patriarchal society that monarchies are known for. So um, at the time, if a family was going to pass an inheritance down to someone, it would go to the oldest son. So if you're the second son or the third son in the family, you pretty much got nothing unless uh, you have good favor 
with your parents or your oldest brother and they can find you a good position or help you get a decent job. So these people had enough money to pay their passage. So many times they came and were given land to do so. So they came for economic opportunity too. Women came for economic opportunity. They were looking for people to marry. And at the time, that's the best economic opportunity women had. So it's really important that you remember that the colonists very much in the 1700s consider themselves British in all ways. They are not trying to get away from Great Britain. They're not running to try to start something new. They're just British across the ocean, that's all. Uh, they're British in everything, their culture, their home decor, their fashion, politics, religion, and uh, race and intellect. They consider themselves British. Here's a picture of Isaac Royal and his family. Um, they moved to Massachusetts from the West Indian island of Antigua, and they took their slaves with them. So these people were rich in the sugar cane industry. And so they moved with them and took their slaves. And I just want to point out the apparel that these people are wearing. So if you get really close, you can see that the um, fabrics look velvety. And a velvet fabric is something that only very affluent people could afford. The rich colors say a lot too, because uh, color, these deep, dark, rich, almost jewel tones, would be how we would refer to them today, but these jewel tone colors are very expensive to make um, because you use more ink to dye the fabric. Uh, the tapestry, the same thing, to get those dark red tones and those rich red tones in that tapestry would have cost a fortune. So these people are very much proud to be British and they're exhibiting British style and all things that go along with being among the British wealthy. Let's talk about Charles I. Charles I took the throne in England in 1625 and he married a French Catholic princess named Henrietta Maria. So if you've picked up a little here and there, uh, as we've talked this semester about England, you know that the big thing between the British uh, monarchy was, oh my gosh, are we gonna be Protestant or are we gonna be Catholic? So now we have Charles I who has taken up with a Catholic princess. And because she was Catholic, the British people did not like her. So the Puritans at this point were very strong in parliament. And I remember the Puritans are people who think that even the Church of England, the Protestant church, just isn't strictly enough against Catholicism. So here they are, they're in charge in parliament. They've got the majority and they speak out every chance they get against Charles I and uh, any kind of rule he tries to pass, including taxes. So that hits King Charles where it hurts. It, it hits his wallet. So he decides to show them who's boss and he suspends parliament for a period of 11 years, which naturally leads to conflict. <laughs> so the English Civil War took place over a period of seven years from 1642 to 1649. Parliament finally got control under the leadership of Oliver Cromwell. And um, under his leadership, they were able to, char to charge Charles I with treason and they had him beheaded. So Oliver Cromwell is this national hero. And the British now are at the point where they need someone to fill in. I mean, they just booted, ousted and uh, technically beheaded their king. So they need someone in charge. And they don't really like the way the king was doing, so they don't want to pass it down to the next heir just yet. They need to buy some time. So they say, hey, Oliver Cromwell, you national hero, you, how about you go fill in and you'll be kind of like the, um, the intermediate person. You know, you'll be the guy who serves in between we figure out what we're going to do. You're going to fill in for us. And so this period of time is actually known as the English interregnum. Inter means between and regnum means kingdom. So Oliver Cromwell, this national hero, was obviously very well loved at the time. They loved him enough to let him take control 
of the English government. However, he really liked that control. That control kind of grew on him. And nine years later, he's still there. He's still in power and he's become somewhat of a dictator. It was his plan when he died in 1658 to pass along this um, kingdom to his son, Richard. But the people didn't want that. They'd just gotten rid of that with Charles I. They did not want this alternate monarchy because that was kind of blasphemous in terms of British culture. I mean, or English culture technically at this time. But um, they didn't want to get away from the monarchy. They just wanted a better monarch. So they restored Charles II to the throne in 1660, which ended the interregnum. And it started what is called the Restoration. Now, if you're Charles I, or I'm sorry, if you're Charles II, and you know that Charles I was hated and beheaded, you're probably going to do all you can not to end up like him. Charles II was next in line for the throne. He was part of the uh, monarch progression. So people were really excited when he came into power because they felt like, their system had been restored. It's not like they hated having a monarchy. They just wanted a monarchy without Catholicism. So Charles II did that for them. And people were so excited about this. It boosted morale. And that morale boost spread. It's, you know, like the power of positive thinking. You know how if you, if you smile at someone, they smile back. I mean, it's kind of like that, only with um, monarchy. So People were super excited that Charles II was king and it helped boost trade with Great Britain. Everyone wanted to trade with them now at this point. During Charles II's reign, he enacted something called the Navigation Act. So we're, we're going to go through those in a few minutes. The important thing is that he did not enforce them. He enacted them through there as a safeguard, but he didn't push it because Charles I ended up beheaded. So Charles II is okay with putting some laws out there, not so much about pushing anything right away. And quite honestly, he's kind of loving this fact that he's so well loved and that things are going great with the Great Britain economy at this time. Um, through Charles II, we have this creation of the restoration colonies. Those colonies are North and South Carolina, which actually started as one, but so the Carolinas, New Jersey and New York also started as one um, colony and they have a D beside them because they were originally Dutch. And then Pennsylvania. Uh, what he did, he did this um, system called proprietary colonies where he gave control of colonies to a trusted person or group. So in the Carolinas, uh, this land was established between Florida, which was Spanish property at the time, and Virginia, which was uh, an English colony. So the English plantation owners from Barbados moved to the Carolinas in 1670 and started a little place called Charlestown. We call it Charleston today, Charleston, South Carolina. They named it for their king, King Charles II. And Charleston was a producer of livestock that was sent to the West Indies. So the British Empire that was so important for the lucrative sugar business so they have now Charleston in the colonies that are producing livestock to send there so that people have uh, protein, they have meat to eat. They also produced sap from pine that was used for tar and pitch. Pitch is just this really sticky, gluey adhesive stuff. Um, a political argument split Carolina into North and South in 1729. So that's why we have two Carolinas today. The South produced rice and indigo. Indigo is an ink, which is very important for getting that deep blue rich tone that we talked about in fabrics earlier. The North Carolina produced turpentine and tar. Both of them produced tobacco. Tobacco was a very important cash crop in the Carolinas. And because of that, because of the expansion of tobacco, slavery developed very quickly. First of all, it was already in place in Barbados, and most of these people came from Barbados to the Carolinas, but because of the uh, slave, because of the labor needed for the tobacco fields, uh, the slave labor grew. 
by 1715, South Carolina actually had a black majority because of the number of slaves in that colony. In uh, the early 1700s, the Carolinas passed slave laws based on laws that were already in place in Barbados that reduced Africans to the status of property. Until that law, uh, there was still an opportunity that these slaves could be treated as indentured servants or could at least be treated as humans. Uh, it's this point when we start to see things kind of take a turn where they are even more taking the human rights away from the slaves. And this picture, I just kind of wanted to let you guys know where it came from. There's this uh, restaurant. I went to Charleston a couple of years ago for a conference and um, it's like 8 King Street or 800 King Street. Um, I just know it was King Street because of King Charles. Anyway, this restaurant, decent food, but uh, one of the neatest things is that it had artwork by local artists in and they painted a lot of uh, pictures or they displayed a lot of the pictures that were painted that depicted slavery. And this one just really struck me. It's got this light and this dark contrast as far as you know the, the light around this woman. Um, she was a slave. She, it's almost like a halo effect. Anyway, it was just a really beautiful picture. So I snapped a copy of it to share in my slides. The Carolinas also had natives. Native Americans lived there when uh, the British settled. The natives suffered from diseases as many of them did when the Europeans came. They also grew dependent on European goods. They would trade deer skin and captive slaves for European guns. So we have the Native Americans also participating in slave trade to a degree. The Yamasee tribe was expect, or I'm sorry, was affected by expanding rice and tobacco fields in the Carolina area. Uh, it was pushing people back. A lot of times we think, oh, the colonists came in, they pushed the Native Americans, they kept pushing and that's it. That's not exactly it. The Native Americans did fight back and the Yamasee almost won their fight against the people of the Carolinas, but the Cherokee joined the British and then they were able to win. Also, I want to mention that English traders took Native women as payment for debt. So well, there, there was a lot of human trafficking at this point in history. Here's another picture that I took when I was in South Carolina, mainly because I was in town at night and uh, exploring the town with some coworkers. And I saw this and so I got to take a picture of it so I know which museum to go back to when I take my family back someday. Okay. Um, New York and New Jersey, as I mentioned, technically they were one big colony at first. It was called New Netherland, which was a Dutch colony. But Charles II, he just wanted it. So in the Second Anglo-Dutch War, he won it and he gave it to his brother James, the Duke of York. And that's why now the city and the colony are named New York. Um, again, it did include, <laughs> excuse me, it did include New Jersey at this time. The thing is, as much as Charles II wanted to give it to his brother, his brother really didn't want it. He didn't want to have to mess with it. So because the Duke of York did not really want to deal with governing this colony, the people of that colony were able to afford a lot of liberties. They formed their own uh, legislature. They established a charter of liberties and privileges that also allowed for trials and representative government there. So the fact that James did not want anything to do with it, really kind of helped it develop and give people a representative voice of government there. The patronship system was used widely throughout this time. And in New York and New Jersey, Robert Livingston got the biggest benefit from the patronship system, which was giving large estates to favorite people. He got 160,000 acres of New York property. Um, the thing about New York, even then it was a melting pot. We always associate that term with New York today, but it was a melting pot then too. It had lots of people with different cultures and religions. There were Dutch, English, French, Jews, Puritans, Quakers, Anglicans, and slaves. There were also Native Americans there. The five nations of Iroquois were there. The Mohawk, the Oneida, the Onondaga, the um, Cayuga, and the Seneca. And 
they work together with the colonists to develop this kind of policy of neutrality. They lived in their own villages, but they did like trading with these people. Um, in Pennsylvania, William Penn benefited from the patroonship system and um, he started Pennsylvania as a colony because he was given this large estate in 1681 because Charles II owed a debt to the Penn family. So by giving William Penn this huge mass of land and what would become the colony of Pennsylvania, he settled his debt. So William Penn was a Quaker and um, the Quakers were the first colonists to truly migrate for religious reasons. I know I mentioned before that we kind of think everyone hated re uh, religion, of religious oppression and that's why the colonists move and moved. And I told you that wasn't exactly true. And here's why, uh, like I mentioned, those others had other reasons for doing this, but the Quakers did come for religious reasons. They'd actually um, gone somewhere else first and decided that Pennsylvania would be the destination. So this religion, they're called Quakers because they believed they had this little inner light. And you may remember from being a child, a little church song, a little Sunday school song called This Little Light of Mine, it reminds me of that. So uh, as their little light would shine, they considered it a spark of divinity and they shook when they were moved by that inner light. Today, if you were talking about something like this, you might hear people talk about being moved by the Holy Spirit or by the Holy Ghost or something like that. So they actually shook a little bit and they were called Quakers because of it. Um, the other thing about the Quakers is that they believed in social equality. So there were no titles. Everyone referred to each other as thee and thou. So uh, it kind of was an early, a really early idea of uh, human equality, which will be important as Pennsylvania continues to grow. So the reason that the Quakers wanted to leave is they had been persecuted in England and even in Massachusetts, uh, some Quakers had been executed. The Quakers first established community at Barbados, but with William Penn's um, patroonship gift, Pennsylvania became their destination. The important thing about Pennsylvania is that when William Penn established this colony, he did not establish an official religion. There was no official religion established for Pennsylvania. This is the first colony to offer true religious tolerance. And so to help build the colony, William Penn gave 50 acres of land to people who would go to Pennsylvania and to complete a term of service. So this is a way that people who can't afford to go can go pioneer this new land. And because those people were of all different kinds of backgrounds, um, it just made sense not to have a, an established religion there. Uh, because of this system he developed with giving land to people um, who would go complete community service, uh, this colony operated on indentured servants more than any other colony through this kind of community service program. They were pacifists too. Um, sometimes we hear that word and we think it's a bad thing. Here it just means they were friendly with the local natives. They did not fight the Native Americans. As a matter of fact, when it came time to expand, they went to the Delaware tribe and said, could we buy some land from you? So they didn't push anybody. They just bought it. They treated everyone like people. They signed a treaty with the Susquehannocks to avoid war. And the other thing, you know, I mentioned that they treated people like people. As Philadelphia starts to grow as a port city and uh, slave ships are coming in and out, it starts to make the Quakers think, this is not treating people like people. So early on, the Quakers saw slavery as a conflict and started working to abolish it. Now, the Navigation Acts, I mentioned to you before that Charles II started the Navigation Acts, but he did not enforce them. 
So uh, the laws that were in place, the 1651 Navigation Act, said that only English ships could carry goods between England and the colonies. And it's not just that the ship had to be English, because at that point, then maybe you're, you've got some subjectivity. Is it English made? Is it English um, led or, or what? So they defined it. Uh, the captain plus three quarters of the crew had to be English in order to trade with the colonies. Also, uh, sugar, tobacco, indigo, rice, molasses, turpentine could only be sent to England. They couldn't send it to Barbados or to Spain or anywhere else. They had to send it back to the mother country. And that was England's way of setting themselves up as a distributor. In 1663, the Staple Act said that colonists could only import goods from England, which created a monopoly. Uh, they couldn't import goods from Spain or um, Portugal or China or anywhere else which also sets England up further as this middleman. The duties tax taxed colony to colony trade. So now the taxes say that if I'm in North Carolina and I have um, rice that I want to trade with you for tobacco in South Carolina, uh, we're gonna have to pay taxes on that. Uh, he established the Lords of Trade, which was this committee to kind of watch over the colonies and then a board of trade to actually enforce customs law. But even though all of these laws were put into place and set into motion, Charles II did not push them. He remained very lax in those laws. Uh, Prime Minister Robert Walpole believed that business ran best without government interference, and that is called salutary neglect. Um, even in 1733 with the Molasses Act, uh, that was even kind of, you know, avoided as well. Uh, people just looked the other way because it would have taxed raw sugar, rum, and molasses that the French and Dutch had in order to make them just buy it from the British. Of course, there was smuggling going on, and even with that law in place, you know, they still were able to buy French and Dutch uh, rum and sugar and stuff. So Charles II's brother comes into power, James II. Uh, James took the throne in 1685, and he decided that he would model his kingdom after that of his cousin, who was King Louis XIV of France. The problem with King Louis XIV, as you might imagine, since he was from France, is that he was also Catholic. And James II, like his cousin the king, was a very strict, intolerant Catholic. He had a Catholic wife and a Catholic son, which is this double whammy threat to Protestantism. Because if James II is a Catholic and he has a son who will be the heir and the son is raised as a Catholic, which he would be by a strict Catholic um, father, then that's two generations of Catholicism. People are upset. Another reason they're upset with James II is that he begins to modernize the English army and navy. Now, technically, is that a bad thing? I mean, if you are a commercial powerhouse, don't you need a good army and navy to protect what you've got? The thing is, it was peacetime. And so the English people started thinking, maybe he's going to use this army against us. Maybe he's going to... Um, become a dictator. You know, they didn't trust him because he was Catholic. Um, they also feared that this Catholic monarchy would end Parliament and their representation as well. And here's a picture of James II here. Um, in 1686, James II created one big enormous colony called the Dominion of New England. And it included Massachusetts, New Hampshire, the area of Plymouth, uh, Connecticut, New Haven, Rhode Island, and he added New York and New Jersey a couple years later. And he put Sir Edmund Andros in charge of the super colony and created a Church of England worship in Puritan Boston, which really made heads spin in Puritan Boston. 
Remember, they absolutely could not stand the Church of England. They thought it was corrupt because it had a little bit of negotiation with Catholicism in it. So they did not like it. Andros also had absolutely no sympathy for the colonists, so he enforced each and every one of those navigation acts. So at this point, the Whigs in England are opposing James II's efforts to centralize the Catholic Church again. And they start working to get rid of James II. The colonists in you know, what will become the United States are upset because you know, they can't trade with anyone really other than Great Britain. So the Whigs start working right away to get rid of James II. In 1688, they ran James out of England and he actually tucked his tail and went to live with his favorite cousin, King Louis XIV in France. Um, this time, instead of like before where they had Oliver Cromwell fill a nine year period, they're like, no, let's be better prepared. Let's have someone waiting in the wings the uh, someone who has a rightful um, claim to the throne. And so they pulled in William of Orange, also known as William III, and his wife, Mary II, who took over the throne then in 1689. While this is going on in Great Britain, the Bostonians overthrow that super colony government, the whole government of New England, and they jail Edmund Andros. And then the New Yorkers overthrow the government there. And so this whole overthrowing James II was a shared bonding event between the colonies and the mother country. It's called the Glorious Revolution. They were so glad to get rid of him and to replace him with William and Mary. But um, it's a shared experience. So even as we approach the 1700s, it just shows that the British connection to the colonist was still very strong. Um, it led to government that limited the power of the monarch and provided protections for subjects. Uh, and that kind of government is still in place in England today, a monarch with um, protections for the subjects and a parliament so that people have a voice in government. They established a Bill of Rights with the constitutional monarchy, checks and balances to make sure that, you know, no one had too much power. And they also guaranteed free speech, regular elections, the right to petition the king and court trials for all who were accused. Uh, the English Toleration Act provided greater diversity for religious diversity throughout the empire, with the exception of Catholics who um, were intentionally excluded from political power because they were afraid that if a Catholic had too much political power, they might take over the nation. So anyway, so when I say the Toleration Act, it was a lot of toleration religiously, but not political toleration in terms of Catholics at the time. So um, one of the other things, one of these new religions that's developing at the time was a was considered a nonconformist religion, the nonconformist I can't talk, the nonconformist Trinitarian Protestants. Well, who are those? Well, they are people who believe in the existence of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, three entities. So that's the Holy Trinity, right? These people were known as Baptist because they believed in adult baptism instead of christening babies or baptizing babies. Uh, they were congregationalist, which meant that they had independent churches. They didn't have a church hierarchy, you know, with bishops and abbeys and all of that stuff, like the Church of England did and like Catholicism did. But the Church of England still remained the official religion of the British Empire, but more tolerance, like I said, was granted, except to Catholics who couldn't have political power. So slavery in the British Empire, in the 18th century, every colony had slaves. So the 18th century would mean the 1700s. Every colony had slaves. The labor system that influenced culture created these kind of supremacy notions. Um, it gave people a visual and an em a visual that they connected with an emotional although um, very much, I don't wanna say made up, but concocted, which means the same thing, but 
uh, kind of this concocted idea that um, it was an us versus them, white people versus black people. And in this particular case, at this particular time in history, the whites shared this racial bond with each other. And not all whites had slaves, but because some whites did have slaves, it kind of led whites to this um, context of time to have this kind of we're better than you kind of attitude. Uh, a very much us versus them othering kind of situation with the Africans who had been sold into slavery. Um, more than 125,000 people were bought on the African coast by the Royal African Company and brought to the um, area that's now the United States between 1672 and 1713. But 20% of those died in the trip because the conditions were just so harsh. The slaves tried to adapt by hanging on to elements of their own culture. Imagine if you can, just for a minute, being ripped out of your home, thrown into a place with people you don't know, people you can't understand. Um, it's a very violent kind of taking. It's not like, you know, someone asks you, hey, would you like to go? You want a lollipop? You know, you want to, it's nothing like that. I mean, these people are ripped away from the people they know and love. They're taken out of the place that they've ever, the only place they've ever known. And they are forced into hard labor. Um, that's a lot mentally to adapt to. So these slaves were very mentally strong in order to be able to adapt, adjust, and continue on. Um, they did resist and try to gain freedom, but most of the time uh, it ended poorly for them. In one instance in South Carolina in 1739, um, the Stono Rebellion is when Jimmy, who was a literate slave, led a large group of slaves in killing some white colonists. Uh, they killed men, women, children, um, whoever. It started as a small group, and as they moved through town, um, other slaves joined them, and the group got bigger. And so military finally stopped them. The slaves were either executed or sold back to the West Indies. Um, that leads to the creation of something called the Better Ordering and Governing of Negroes and Other Slaves in 1740 in South Carolina. This greatly limited what slaves could do. So these people who have tried to hang on to little elements of their culture one way or another, um, either by you know, maintaining contact with someone else who might have been from their village or um, hanging on to stories that you know, they could tell from their own past or whatever, this very much limits that. Um, it takes even more rights away from slaves. Um, it limited their ability to assemble with each other because if you allow the slaves to assemble, they might plan a coup attempt. Um, it limited their learning. Uh, it actually made teaching slaves to read or write illegal because Jimmy was literate and look what he did, right? Um, travel was no longer free. Um, and to me, well, one of the worst things, I mean, that, those are all bad things, don't get me wrong, but they were no longer allowed to grow their own food. So at least before this, slaves were able to produce food to take care of themselves and the people that, you know, shared their lives. They were forced to um, grow food for their masters and their masters' families but they still had the ability to grow food for themselves as well. So with this law, this puts food in charge, or puts masters in charge of how much food these people get. They can use it against them. They can limit their food, um, which is just another harsh, cruel, mental aspect, as well as a physical aspect that these slaves really um, endured. So 
this host whole Stono Rebellion from 1739, you know, we didn't have social media back then. So stories traveled a little slower. It took 1741 for uh, this conspiracy theory to get to New York. But uh, one night in New York, 13 fires broke out all across the city. And so whites start spreading the rumor that they were started by slaves who were going to plan to murder the whites. And so then some others, some Protestants jump in and go, I heard the Catholics were involved too. <laughs> so anyway, it's like the majority of people, the, the majority, were making up rumors about the minority. And uh, these rumors really caused a lot of problems. It ended up in the arrest of about 200 people that were Catholics and slaves. Uh, 17 were executed. There were 13 black men burned at the stake they would have been slaves. Four whites who would have been Catholic were hanged and 70 slaves were sold back to the West Indies. Now, also in the colonies at this time, the gentry is developing as a wealthy colonial class. These people are refined, they're free from rudeness and they are very much modeled after British aristocracy. They have big mansions and where you have a big mansion, you have power because big mansion means money and money means power. So. These people, the gentry class, set themselves apart with their display of goods, and it creates this consumer revolution. Everyone in the colonies wanted what people back home had. Tea was fashionable. They started reading little journals and books and psalms like little prayer books. And women even started reading these little adventure novels, but only the gentry class had access to those in the colonies. Also in this time period, we had the first Great Awakening. It's a period of Protestant revival. Um, worship had been pretty sterile at this point. Pretty boring, maybe would be a good word. Uh, very ritualistic. So these evangelists in this Protestant revival preached the idea of a personal relationship with God and the importance of faith. It took religion way past Bible study and made it personal. And it was a huge deal for people to start thinking that they could influence their own salvation by accepting Christ. This was very inclusive. You didn't have to be rich to accept Christ. You could do that, anyone could do that. So it was very, very inclusive. Man, woman, child, didn't matter. Uh, the inclusivity of being able to um, have salvation was a huge uh, spiritual awakening at this point in history. Um, these preachers were very much the hellfire and damnation preachers. They were loud and uh, they drew attention. So some of the first evangelists of note were James Davenport, who started off talking about burning books and he got some attention for that. You know, some of the old books that uh, maybe alluded to immoral things, that sort of stuff. He said, let's burn those books. And people did. And then he starts talking about clothing. Let's burn this clothing. And people are like, eh, you're going a little far there, Betty. So that did not take off. But he did establish seminaries to train more evangelists, which was a big input in the Great Awakening period. Also, I wish we had time to read it all through this chapter. But Jonathan Edwards wrote Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, which was a sermon that was so powerful. And uh, if you get a chance, Google it sometime, it's free. You can find it on Google, but just kind of look it up and see the kind of language in it. Um, very, very um, strong, very strong. George Whitefield um, believed that religion appealed to people's passions and that you could not separate passion from people because it's just part of what humans are. Humans are passionate about things. So he says, religion appealed to people's passions. And one of my most favorite quotes ever came from John Wesley, who was a Methodist evangelist. If you've ever heard of the Wesley Foundation that's uh, generally associated with a Methodist church, then it's named for, for this guy, this evangelist. He said, I set myself on fire and others come to watch me burn. Now, in the 1700s, obviously, this means something very different than it might mean for people on a TikTok channel these days. And plus, I did spend the day watching World's Dumbest uh, earlier, World's Dumbest Thrill Seekers. So John Wesley did not really 
like douse himself with fuel and set himself on fire. Okay, I just want to get that out of the way. He's talking figuratively. What he's saying is he gets to the pulpit and he unleashes his passion for preaching and his passion for his God. And because he is so passionate, people would go watch him. And it very much was a show. It was very much social entertainment. And it was salvation all wrapped into one. So if you were looking for something to do in the colonies, you might have attended a revival, not just for fun, but uh, for salvation as well. The Enlightenment period is known as the Age of Reason, and it's this period that uh, kind of replaces superstitions, myths, and prejudice with reason and science. Now, some prejudice, we still have slavery here, so, you know, obviously it doesn't um, replace everything. But some words that you need to know associated with the Enlightenment are rationalism, which meant that humans are capable of using their own ability to reason to gain knowledge. You didn't have to rely on scripture. You could um, experience or experiment and observe things for yourselves, which is our next definition, empiricism. Knowledge comes from experience and observation. And that people just being humans were qualified to do that. They didn't have to have a Bible to tell them how, which led to this progressivism that through reason and observation, Humans can make process or can make progress over time. You didn't have to wait for a, a biblical sign or find it in scripture. And this led to cosmopolitanism, which means citizens of the world. People were more open-minded about new cultures, which also leads to religious toleration and um, also creates a more open environment. You know, anytime you meet someone new and you learn something about their tradition, you've expanded your mind. And that's what was going on during the enlightenment. Also, just a note about the Freemasons. I just wanted to throw this out here because the Freemason fraternal societies started cropping up in the 1700s in the colonies. And uh, they would meet in coffee houses or uh, local community rooms. And this led to the development of what we know today as Masonic lodges. And you can look around town and your town may also still have a Masonic Lodge where people meet weekly, monthly or whatever. Um, it, they're known as Masons. Okay, um, just to touch base on the wars, we're not gonna get into them too much. Um, let's see here. What are the, okay, the Queen, Queen Anne's War was a second war with France that uh, was trying to gain control over parts of North America. Great Britain sent aid to help protect the Charleston area because it was a port area, but they left New York all the way through New England exposed. Um, the British captured Acadia, which is in New France, so what we now know as Canada, and it then became the British province of Nova Scotia. And British also got the Hudson Bay area from France, which was the area in question that they wanted to protect in North America. So when the French and the um, and Great Britain were fighting over these colonies, the French have had always allied with the Indians. And so um, there would be these just horrible attacks on these British villages. One of them was uh, a French force with some Mohawks and uh, Abenaki tribe members kidnapped a minister's daughter, a British minister's daughter. She was seven years old and her name was Eunice and they took her back to Canada. And she actually assimilated with um, the Mohawk tribe and married a Mohawk man and just refused to ever return to England even when she got older and could do so. So um, there were attacks, not just from um, colonists onto Indians, but the Native Americans into the colonists as well. So the last thing I want to mention, the French and Indian War. You'll have a question about this. Who won the French and Indian War? Great Britain won the French and Indian War. Um, it was a nine-year fight between Great Britain and the French over some colonies in America, which included parts of Pennsylvania. Um, they were kind of claiming some of the same land. 
So the Iroquois, Delaware, and Shawnee signed a tribe, or I'm sorry, signed a treaty with Great Britain. And after that, the British were able to take Quebec and Montreal in Canada, which kind of crumbled the French Empire, and that's how Great Britain was able to win the French and Indian War. A lot of people don't realize Great Britain was in the French and Indian War because Great Britain isn't in the name. So Great Britain won the French and Indian War. It ended with the Treaty of Paris when England got these American colonies that had been in question, plus the Sugar Islands in the West Indies. And that does it for Chapter 4's lecture notes.